Hey there, it's Kevin. I really just realized that the reflection of the screen makes my face look really red. So let's get off of this slide. All right. So today's topic is this, uh, for the Skyway community training. It's an update on the commercial item definition. Uh, does it sound like a big deal? But it actually is a pretty big deal. Okay. So let's see if I can make this work. There we go. Much better light. Okay. So overview of what we're going to cover. You know, what is a commercial item? There's a new definition. Uh, it's an expanded definition. I'll get into that. Um, there are a lot of things that are commercial. I think, well, most things can can probably probably be spun to say they're commercial. That's why this is worth talking about. Uh, the memorable and portable idea is that the thinking commercial first is the first the first thing I recommend people do is to say, is this a commercial item? All right. Once you've once you've determined that possibility, then from there you can you can make additional strategies on, on the acquisition strand acquisition plan. Okay, what to do? Uh, there are five elements of the definition now, where well, there used to be one, and things like service, product, software. I'm going to get get through each one of those and show you how they apply. All right. So why it's important? Let's start with that. It's a new swipe. <laughs> So why this matters, okay? Uh, the FAR Council, they're the ones that actually update the FAR, no kidding, right? Uh, they updated the, the definition of a commercial item. And it now is broken out from, it used to be commercial item, just meant services, products, everything. They called it an, a commercial item. But now it actually breaks out commercial product, commercial service, and, and it's more specificity instead of just using the term commercial item. Um, also, does actually change the term commercial item throughout the rest of the FAR to specify commercial product, commercial service, commercial software, et cetera. Uh, so all the places that the term commercial item, which is pretty nebulous, they've now been replaced with the specificity of a commercial service, product, et cetera, because they do uh, operate differently. And there was some confusion. Um, in fact, I tell a story later about how that confusion can manifest in, in, in from the contractor's perspective. But this is one of those things that when you understand why it's changed, then it, it's easier to, to apply it. It's important to note that the rules behind using uh, uh, commercial items hasn't changed. So the concept of the application of a commercial item, i.e. commercial product or service or software or commercial off the shelf item, that kind of stuff, the, the rules and how they can use them, they being the government can use them have not changed. It's just the definition is more specific. Okay, so what are we talking about specifically here? Like I said, it used to say, the FAR, be more specific, the FAR used to say the definition of a commercial item is blank. Well, now it's broken out by commercial product, service, end item, software, and commercial off the shelf item. So now there's, there are five different elements. It's, it's much more wordy. It doesn't fundamentally change anything, but it's a lot easier to understand for those of you who don't live in the FAR. Uh, it's kind of funny. I was talking to Shelly, Shelly Hall from our team about this, and she's like, I think it's just more words, but it's not any different. Um, but when I talk to, to our customers and I talk to contractors, and I realize it's very different for, for you uh, because it's, it's, it's much easier to understand that your product or service is actually commercial because it's been much more broken out. And we're going to dig into that a little bit here. Okay, uh, apologize, very wordy slide. Uh, feel free to read it at your, at your leisure. Uh, the, the, the value of this is, this is, again, this is a language right out of the FAR. So rather than cherry pick and then put only the points in here, I decided I'm gonna give you the whole story and then the red is the cherry pick that I'm gonna talk through, okay? So this is the first one. This is a commercial product, the definition of a commercial product. And basically it's a product other than, other than, other than uh, real property, other than uh, real estate of a type customarily used by the general public. You recognize that language from the last definition. That's not new, right? Um, but it goes on to say it, it has been or has been offered to be, real nuance there. In fact, there are two different paragraphs, but I, I compressed them there. So has been or has been offered to be sold, leased, or licensed to the general public. That's a commercial product. Is this is something that either is currently being sold to the general public or leased or it's offered to be, okay? That's not new. Now we get more into the specificity of this new definition. Let me clarify. That's not new from what it used to say, <laughs> but it's important to understand. Now we dig into this and say, okay, well, what makes it a, a commercial product? And the next paragraph, the next one here is the product that evolved from a product described in paragraph one. So if you have a commercial item that you have tweaked, and definition of tweak, again, you can drive a truck through that. 
Okay. When you're, when you're talking to the customer, I'm going to pull out the three deciders, right? You got the customer, the economic decider, and the contracting officer. When you're talking to the customer, these are the kind of things have them take to the contracting officer and say, here's why it's evolved from a commercial item. Ergo, by this definition, it's still a commercial product. Okay. The, and so, and it, again, you can read into the nuances of that, but basically what it says is if it's been sold commercially, as is described in paragraph one, and it's evolved, actually, or it's evolved from a, a, a product that looks like the ones in, in number one. So that, that's a nice nuance to add. In addition, now you get into paragraph three that, okay, if it looks like number one, and it would get really confusing here. Number one is this whole paragraph where something that has been offered or sold to the general public. Okay, that's what I, when I say paragraph number one, that's what I'm talking about. Paragraph one is something that has been offered or sold to the general public. And so paragraph three here, if it has been, if it looks like something in number one, except for it's been modified, it's been militarized. It can be, this is gonna sound kind of crazy, but I actually had this happen. It's painted a color that only the military wanted. I actually had a debate with an attorney over, well, that's not a commercial item anymore. Yes, it is, <laughs> because it's just a different color. It's, it's, a modif it's a modification of a type customarily available, right? So you can paint a car a color, you can paint a car a color, any color that you want, right? Well, same idea. In this case, it was, it was, a, it was a commercial uh, ATV that we painted a different color, right? So it's still a commercial item. That's an easy example. There are other ones that get more complex. But again, if it's a minor modification, in addition to a a typical modification, like this is a different color that we don't necessarily have. We don't sell 20% of our cars in this color, but we're going to allow uh, the government to buy it in this color. Therefore, it's still a commercial item. Or that next paragraph, it's, it's a minor modification. It's not really available. However, it does not significantly alter the non-governmental function. In other words, it doesn't change it from being a vehicle into something else. It doesn't change it from being a software product or a, a, you know, a platform into now all of a sudden it's, it's now an operating system. That, that's what I mean. It's not, it's not fundamentally changing what it does. It's still a commercial item. Now we get into the weeds even more here. Okay. Paragraph four is if something that combines one, two, and three is of a type customarily combined. In other words, if they, if in the public in the public sector, they are sorry, in the private sector, they buy it in bulk in the general public buys this in bulk commercial item. Just because they don't buy it individually like the government might be doing, commercial item, right? Um, paragraph five, same thing, combination of products referred to in one through four, even though the product or, or combination of products is transferred, this is a fun one, is transferred between or among separate divisions, subsidiaries, or affiliates of a contractor, blah, blah. What does that mean? That's kind of targeted to large, large organizations. So if it's, okay, here's one. If it's an aircraft, that Boeing sells commercially, and just because they're selling it through the military arm of, of, um, of Boeing, this is what I would use to say it's still a commercial item. Most of our customers, most of you watching this video, you don't sell aircraft. <laughs> it's not your niche. But you could make the argument that, hey, we, we sell it over here to the commercial. It's the same product. Just because it's a different division, just because it has, you know, it's, it's going through a zipper net versus being on a nipper net, paragraph five allows for that. Okay. Again, this is specificity that wasn't in the definition before. And then the last one, even if it's a non-developmental item, all right, and the procuring agency determines that it was developed exclusively at your private, ex private expense, you, you being the contractor, and it's been sold in, in substantial quantities, and here's the catch, on a competitive basis to include foreign governments. Now, here's the one I, I, I've, I've gotten hung up on this one before because I've, I've spun the language of this before. We had, okay, I'll, I'll pick up, we had a, a weapon that we actually bought for Special Operations Command. I won't get into what it was, but it was, it was a weapon, right? And it was sold to other countries, but it wasn't a commercial item because they're the only ones that made it. This one company was the only one. They, they sold it to like, you know, allied, com uh, allied countries, but it wasn't on a competitive basis. So you have to have all these pieces, private expense, substantial quantities on a competitive basis. So if you made it yourself and you made it, you, you the contractor, and then you sold it to the DOD, but no one else makes it, it's gonna be a lot harder to make that case that it's a commercial item. Still possible if you, if you string these together hard enough, but that's really the, 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 the easiest way for me to wrap my head around it 
from a, from a justifying it as a contracting officer is it has to meet all three of those private and then I sold in substantial quantities and on a competitive basis. Somebody else also has a solution that you're competing against. If all those three are met, then I, I would use paragraph six to make the case that it's a commercial item. My point of going through all these in, in, in detail is I want everybody, all of our customers to understand it's a pretty good chance that your product is commercial. If you sell a product, it's pretty, it's not easy, <laughs> but it can be easy to make the case that it's a commercial item. Why do you want that? I'll get to that later, but the moral of the story is that it makes the process more efficient, allows you to, to be sheltered from having to share a lot of cost data, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of benefits to this. And these are the elements that you can specifically uh, point to when you're specifically talking about a commercial product. All right, I'm gonna keep moving here. I'm gonna jump into services. Again, here's, there's two basic elements to talk about. Uh, installation services, which is you know, maintenance services, et cetera, et cetera. Produced for support of a commercial product. So if you have a commercial product for that last paragraph we just talked about, ergo, the services that are attached to it are by definition commercial. Even if you're only selling them to the government, like maybe you're the only customer who needs you to physically install this software happens to be your government customer. By this paragraph, I would say still a commercial service, even though you don't provide that service in substantial quantities to the, the, the private sector, yeah, the private sector, because they already know how to do it. They have their own system or whatever. But again, these are little nuances, all right? If the source of such services providing similar services contemporaneously to the general public, so that's the other side, is if you give these services at the same time, it's commonplace to buy the product and the services, then there you go. So if you have a service package that comes with your product, if the product is commercial, both of these paragraphs give you the ability to make the case that the services associated with said product are also commercial. I hope you follow that. <laughs> I talk very fast. I'm fully caffeinated today. Okay. So then the other type of services, and this is the, the general concept. Of, I'm going to read it because it's, it's worth getting the words. Of a type offered and sold competitively, there it is, in substantial quantities, there's another one, in the commercial marketplace based on established catalog or market prices. Where's the catalog come from? your website, you, you print it and mail it to people. It's some commonly available, not, not something, hey, here's our catalog that we invented for you. They need to be able to find it. The easiest way to make this argument is they need, need to be able to find it from a third party. Like they should be able to Google it or go to your website on their own and get that catalog price, right? That's the, and the market prices are some evidence that this is what the market bears for. And then that last paragraph, paragraph three, similar to the, the, the paragraph five in the last, uh, in the product uh, example, was that if it's transferred between different, different parts of the same company, it's still considered commercial. If this is a commercial service you provide over here, just because it's the military arm of your company, just because it's through a government contract doesn't change the fact that it's, it's still a commercial service. E even if the government didn't consider it commercial before, when, if you're selling it commercially through another part of your company, that is a really good argument to say that those services fit under the commercial element here under uh, paragraph three. All right, still rolling. Here's the rest of them, okay? The commercially available off-the-shelf item. Basically, the, um, in a nutshell, you can read through all this, but what this really comes down to is the product we talked about before a couple slides ago is if it's if it's going to be slightly modified or modified in, in a way that's common that's common in the commercial marketplace, et cetera, commercial off the shelf, hence the term off the shelf means that it's without modification. That's the biggest difference here is that the, the reason this is worth talking about, I put that little translation element there, is that an item may be a commercial product, but it may not be a commercial off the shelf product. For purposes of deciding whether or not they're a commercial item and, and can fit under FAR Part 12, it's the same thing. But it's important to understand, it's like, it's like the square and the rectangle, and like a, a, a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square, right? And so a COTS item is a square, but a commercial item by definition isn't always going to be COTS, particularly if you're selling to a nuanced customer like the DOD or, or Department of Homeland Security. They have some nuance that they may want to add. It's still a commercial item, but it's not a COTS item. And there's, their agency is going to have specific elements to that, but I'm going to get into that. What I'm talking about today is just the definition. It's the definition is clearly laid out for us. All right, the, the last two little pieces, and this is literally all they say in the far. This is about the shortest definition I've ever seen. Okay, and I'm going to read them because they're that funny. 
Commercial component means, wait for it, any component that is a commercial product. Hmm, thanks. That wasn't clear enough from just the words of it, but okay, sure. Uh, and then this one's worth talking about because we have a couple of customers that sell software. In fact, several customers that sell software, right? And we had this discussion over, is a software a product? Is a software a service? It's a whole nother training I'm making on that. The short answer is it depends. It can be either. It depends on what the customer, what the government customer defines it as. But here, to, to prove the point, commercial computer software means any computer software that is a commercial product or commercial service. What does that mean? That means that if your product, if it's a software product, that you sell it as a product, and it fits under the definition that I, of a product, which was three slides ago, it's commercial software. Likewise, if it is commercial as a service, or sorry, software as a service, and it's something that fits under two slides ago, they specifically talked about service that are commercial, it fits. So if it's a commercial software and you can identify it or your customer can identify it as a product or a service, it's, it's considered uh, a, a commercial item. Hope that helps. All right, let's land the plane here. So when does this matter? I'm getting really into the weeds here. This is going to go a little bit longer than normal, but you're getting a lot more meat on the time zones than uh, than the normal podcast. And so here's the, like here's each one of the time zones, okay? And why the the commercial item issue applies to in this case all of them except for the honeymoon zone. And I'm going to walk you through each one. So the requirement zone, the requirement can be influenced by whether or not something is commercial. Like what's the art of the possible? If 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 I go out and try and buy something and then I discover that based on the requirement I have, this is something that with a minor tweak, remember the whole minor adjustment that I talked about in, in, the, in the, the, the example about a commercial product, with a minor adjustment, I can use a commercial item. That minor adjustment could be fit into the requirement and that fundamentally changes the acquisition strategy, which is the next zone, market research zone. And so you had this commercial versus non-commercial determination. And remember, I, we talked in, in other episodes and training about there's a difference between a determination and a decision. A determination is is backed is based on some regulatory guidance of the, I'm determining this based on what I'm allowed to do. A decision is given the options I'm allowed to take, I'm taking this one, right? Well, a commerciality determination is a determination of based on the justification that I can pull out of, of, of these paragraphs of the definition of a commercial product or service I have determined, based on the evidence that I have, that this is a commercial item. That decision of whether something is commercial or not is made during the market research zone. And it is going, it is like, it's almost as critical as the whole uh, uh, going sole source versus competing. I mean, there are two different paths to go down. In fact, in, in episode 370, we talk about the, the compete versus not compete. This is that same idea. Commercial versus non-commercial fundamentally changes how we can acquire it changes a lot of things about you know, who, who can apply for it, how much it's gonna cost, what we can ask for as, as far as pricing data, how, how much information we can collect, how fast it's gonna take, what clauses go in, et cetera. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in there. Okay, RFP zone. Again, using FAR Part 12, there's a limited number of clauses that can be included. FAR Part 15, which is usually what's, in, I'm oversimplifying, but for the purposes of this conversation, if it's a pure FAR Part 15, because you still use FAR Parts, 15 and 12 concurrently. That's a whole other conversation. But if you're using a FAR Part 15 section that's non-commercial, there's a much larger chunk of clauses <laughs> that fit in there, right? So that's one example. The timelines are going to be longer. Uh, the rules about how long I give you to, to respond, et cetera, et cetera, are very different. During the selection zone, how the selection zone plays out is going to be driven by what happened in the market research zone and the RFP zone. And what's driven in those two is the decision sorry, the determination to go with a commercial versus non-commercial. So a big impact in the selection zone. In the performance zone, they could be the same, but keep in mind, depending on what you're doing, if it's a commercial service or a commercial product and that product is bought in a certain way and it, and it has uh, services built into it, if it's a product or if it has specific elements that are included only by because it's it's part of a commercial package or if it's it's sold in, in bulk, for example, that could in fact impact the performance zone. The recompete zone, we have two major questions. It wasn't commercial last time. Can it be next time when we recompete it? Or it was commercial last time. Is this still the right? Is it still a commercial item? Did it work? 
or do we, or is this really a non-commercial and we, and we bent the rules a little bit too far, which by the way, I've only seen that happen once. Most of the time it goes the other way. It goes from non-commercial to, to commercial. And then the wrap up, imagine we've talked about the wrap up zone. Uh, we talked about wrap, I mean, closing out contracts. The amount of effort it takes to wrap, to wrap up or close out a commercial contract, a FAR Part 12 contract is significantly less than what it takes to close out a cost type FAR Part 15 contract, right? So all of these zones are impacted by this key decision of does what we do fit under the definition of commercial product or service? So why does the government care about this? Again, it creates a, a lot more clarity for the government team. This new definition is, is more, has more specificity. Um, I think the goal of, of this change was not to give additional rules and, and give additional authority, but it gave enough consistency, it gave enough additional clarity that I think we're gonna see more consistency of understanding what is a commercial product. What is a commercial service? Because they've delineated, they being the FAR Council, have delineated more of what that specifically means. So in theory, my theory is that this, this should expand the use of FAR Part 12 because now it's more clear what fits in it. For example, the title of FAR Part 12 used to be commercial item procedures. And we get into this debate of what's a commercial item? Is it, is it a service? Is an item a service? I'll distract it. Whereas now that FAR Part 12 is now called acquisition of commercial products and commercial services specificity in the title it should tell you how much they're moving in the right direction this is also from a from a contracting officer perspective moving to commercial contracts here's some examples of they're, they're less complex just just from the clauses but on top of that just the, the amount of time it takes to to not to synopsize them for as long uh, you don't have to have as much detail behind them um, it's easier in quotes to justify price the, um, the, it's easier to justify paying a higher price to me because if it's a commercial item and, and you're a commercial business that's been around for 25 years and this is the price you charge, when somebody comes in and says, I can do it for half that, I'm like, oh, you've only been in business for two weeks. <laughs> From a commercial services perspective, I'm a little leery that you're going to be able to do it for that price since this company that's been doing it commercially has charged this much. I mean, that's an argument that I've made in, in, a, in a, a price negotiation memorandum before. You also have fewer regulatory requirements, which I talked about before, as far as now, how long it needs to be out in the market, how long it needs to be synopsized, et cetera. And I say they're less invasive for contractors because I'm not entitled to know your cost data, no matter the circumstances, right? That's the big difference is that even if I think there should, I should have additional insight, FAR Part 12 says I'm not entitled to it. I'm not allowed to have the, uh, the, the details, which means you don't have to certify your cost data which means <laughs> that you're saving potentially a lot of time and a lot of risk and a lot of cost, right? Uh, these are also faster to award. Um, I had a preference for commercial items as much as I possibly could for that very reason. They were much faster to award. All right, so why does industry care? Oh, it's funny, now we have the little, the little drop downs. <laughs> Interesting. And so what I mentioned before, that, that, ne that nebulous term commercial item was a little bit too... Oh, nebulous. It wasn't as specific as what they put in now. So now it's, it's more uh, useful. Okay. And so here's, this is a very, I'm not going to read this to you, but it gives you an idea of, of why it can be confusing. I was giving uh, one of the trainings that we have, the, 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 key, the key FAR parts, and it goes through the, the, the basic FAR parts, uh, 12, uh, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. And those are the key ones that if you know, understand those, you can do a lot in, in government contracting. Well, it starts with FAR part 12, right? And so in the middle of this training, as a company that sells software. And at the time, this is in the old days, six months ago, I would, it, and I was referring to it as a commercial item. To me, when I said FAR Part 12 is for acquisition of commercial items, and the students who sell software were thinking, well, does that apply to us? Because we're not an item, we're software. And it was a big distraction. Well, big in terms, it took us like five minutes to walk through it and explain why when, when the government says commercial item, they mean products and services. Well, it's almost like they heard me doing this training because within two months, this came out. <laughs> and so now we have a formal, they have a, a formal, more detailed definition. There's now five different elements they talk about as far as you know, product, service, commercial off the shelf, et cetera. And so th this example helps you helps understand that as a contractor, if, if you don't know that the term commercial item refers to products, services, software, commercial off the shelf, et cetera, it was probably pretty frustrating going into FAR Part 12 and thinking, does this apply to me or not? Whereas now you can read through there and go, yeah, that's us. We had a commercial product 
that with minor minor uh, adjustments as defined right here in, in, FAR, in FAR Part 12, specifically, actually in FAR Part 2 is where this definition is, but it specifically says that's that's exactly what we would do. It makes it a lot easier to, to navigate this new, to navigate commercial items with this new definition. Okay, so big takeaway, it doesn't really change anything as far as your the contracting officer's authority to use FAR Part 12, why the government would use it, et cetera. But it does add so much clarity to what is a commercial product or service that I think the net result is we're going to use it more. That additional specificity does help, would help me as the contracting officer to justify this is a commercial item. Here's why. It's right in the definition. It's no longer a judgment call. It's no longer a decision that I'm making based on, well, I kind of feel like this is, an, this is a minor modification. I kind of feel like software would be a service. It should be commercial because they sell it commercially. Now I can look at that definition and copy and paste it into my document that justifies my, my use of FAR Part 12, and off I go. That's much faster. It's a much, much better solution. And that's the highlights. So if you need more help on this, need more specificity for your particular situation, remember as a Skyway customer, you have access to our team. Here is the team. If you're not familiar, I'm the dude up in the corner there. That's me, that's Kevin. Um, those of you, I would say the, the most familiar with commercial would be myself and Shelly and David, definitely. And probably a little bit of Troy. Uh, but I definitely, if you have an issue of, I'm trying to make the case that this is a commercial item, I would start with me and then Shelly and then David. Uh, the rest of the team can help with it too, but I've specifically dealt with uh, writing commercial item determinations pretty regularly um, as a contracting officer. So yeah, it's, it's right up our alley. And remember, as a Skyway customer, you have three different elements here. You have the consulting, which I just showed you the team, the training, which you're sitting in the training right now, you're getting that piece. And you also have access to this, this Skyway community tools like the Ask a Contracting Officer Forum and other videos and whatnot that we've created. So if you want, well, I'm assuming you do, <laughs> you want more training like this on a particular topic, on whatever topic, send me an email, send Shelly an email. We'll put it in the queue and I will see you at the next one. But yeah, the, the goal is to get these under 30 minutes. I think I did that. Oh, 30 minutes and four seconds. I'm just over. <laughs> so I wanted to get a, a, a really deep dive into this new definition. Hope this was helpful and have a great day.